Minnesota, northernmost sector of Major League Baseball, with its twin cities of Minneapolis, from one of which rises the mighty Mississippi that flows on through the twin cities. But neither the Mississippi nor longtime rivalry could keep the twin cities apart once a baseball franchise became a possibility. A new stadium was built by joint effort. And then in 1961, baseball was welcomed by Minnesota with such boundless enthusiasm that in the first five years, the Twins have drawn nearly seven million fans. Here's one of their slugging heroes, Harmon Killebrew. Followed by Zoilo Versailles, the Twins' brilliant shortstop. Their World Series foes, the Dodgers, warm up leisurely. The Dodgers present the first switch hitting infield ever seen in a World Series. Wes Parker, Maury Will, Jim Lefevre, and Jim Gilliam. Commissioner Ford Frick, who has led baseball through 14 successful years, is presiding at his last World Series before retiring from the game. Walter Alston is a familiar World Series figure after piloting the Dodgers to five pennants. But for manager Sam Mealy of Minnesota, it's the first World Series appearance of any sort. Don Drysdale, Dodgers starting pitcher, never misses a turn at bat. Jim Mudcat Grant, who will start for the Twins, is completely relaxed as he talks with reporters. The Twins whirl through infield practice in their final loosening up exercises. Manager Mealy and Dodger captain Maury Wills join the umpire huddle. Vice President Hubert Humphrey throws out the first ball. He'll be cheering for the Twins. And the color guard comes to attention for the flag raising ceremonies. And there go the Twins out of the field. Mudcat Grant takes his final warm-up pitches, and the stage is set for the opening of the 1965 World Series. Maury Wills looks at the first pitch, and it's a strike. After fouling off two pitches, Wills is called out on strikes, and the Minnesota crowd loves it. In the Dodgers second, Ron Fairley rips into a three and two pitch. Tony Oliva races back to the fence. But it's in there for a home run. The first Ron has ever hit in three World Series. Harmon Killebrew talks with Grant while Alston and the Dodgers congratulate Fairley. Don Mincher steps up in the Minnesota second, and the count is one and one. The huge Twins first baseman connects solidly with all his power. Fairley looks on from the other end this time as the ball sails high into the bleachers. It's a 400-footer for Big Don, and the score is all even at one to one. In the Twins' third, Frank Quillacy lashes one past Gilliam with umpire Ed Sudol right there to make the call. The ball finally caroms off the corner of the stands for a double. That brings Grant to the plate. Drysdale checks the runner at second. Grant lays down a bunt. Drysdale's bad knee gives way momentarily and he falls while fielding the ball. But he recovers, gets off a throw. It's short and bounces once into the hands of Jim Lefevre. He's out. No. Umpire Benson sees Lefevre isn't in control of the ball. Grant is safe. Quillacy has moved to third on the play. Zoilo Versailles looks for a sign. Drysdale pitches, and Versailles gets around on this one. He pulls it down the line. It's another home run. Versailles, key man all year for the Twins, scores behind Quillacy and Grant. And Minnesota leads 4-1. to one. Gilliam talks with Drysdale, while Alston looks out of the dugout. Drysdale faces Sandy Valdespino next. 
and the chunky outfielder smashes the first pitch into the right field corner and races to second base for a stand-up double. With the bases loaded and two outs following Killebrew's single and Mincher's walk, Drysdale is confronted by Earl Batty. The burly catcher lifts a pop fly into short right. It drops for a hit, and Valdespino and Killebrew both score. At this point, manager Alston is getting a bit concerned. On Drysdale's first pitch, Quillacy singles to right for his second hit of the inning. And Mincher scores to make it 7-1. Drysdale departs from the ball game. Going into the Dodger eight, the Twins lead eight to one. With one away, Grant faces Fairley once more. And again, Ron hammers one deep to right. But Oliva sprints along the fence and pulls it down. In the ninth, Grant has one out with Parker on first and Lefevre on third. Don LeJohn is up as a pinch hitter. Grant, eager to go all the way, whips a third strike past LeJohn. Now Grant is only one out away from victory. Maury Wills drags a beautiful bunt down the first baseline. Grant makes a fine play on the ball, but Wills beats it out. And Lefevre scores. Jim now must try for that final out with Gilliam at bat. He gets it when Gilliam flies to Valdespino. And Minnesota wins 8-2. Killebrew leads the rush of the Twins to congratulate Grant. The Mudcats scattered 10 hits to vanquish Drysdale. But he had to share honors with Versailles, who drove in four runs, and Oliva, who set a new series record for right fielders with nine putouts. Bob Allison made a sensational catch on Jim Lefevre's drive down the left field line in the fifth inning of the second game for the key play in a 5-1 to one victory by Jim Cott over Sandy Koufax. It gave the Twins a 2 to nothing lead as the World Series shifted to Los Angeles. The exterior of Dodger Stadium is beautiful. Being back home, the players' spirits seem to rise. Their brilliant captain, Maury Wills, leads off the batting practice. A couple of Twins take some home movies. Wes Parker, youthful Dodger first baseman, takes a few swings. American League President Joe Cronin and his wife beam happily. And why not, after two victories by the Twins? Camilo Pasquale will try to make it three straight for Minnesota. Claude Osteen is Alston's choice to get the Dodgers back in contention. Dodger Stadium, one of baseball's most impressive structures with its many-tiered, multicolored stands. The color guard marches into center field for the flag-raising ceremonies, and the fans and players come to attention. All eyes then are focused on the scene behind the plate, where Casey Stengel throws out the first ball. The Dodgers take the field faced with a must game, and their fans fervently hope they can turn the tide. In the Dodger fourth, the game still is scoreless as Fairley leads off the inning. Pasquale takes his big windup, cuts loose, and Ron smashes the ball just inches inside third base. And he pulls up at second with a double. Now... Run is on first and third. Wes Parker is the batter. Parker draws a walk, and Batty tries to pick Fairley off third, but misses. Parker's walk fills the bases with only one out, and Pasquale is in trouble. 
Pasquale faces Roseboro, who singles and fairly comes on home. Also heading for the plate is Jim Lefevre, who scores standing up, and the Dodgers are out in front, two to nothing. In the Dodger fifth, Batty huddles with Pasquale. The National Leaguers have a man in scoring position again. Willie Davis is on second with Lou Johnson at bat. Pasquale comes to a set position, delivers, and Johnson drives the ball into the left center alley. It's a double, and Davis scores easily. The Los Angeles Dodgers now lead three to nothing in five innings. Jim Merritt takes over the Minnesota pitching in the Dodgers' sixth. Wes Parker wraps a single into center field. With Parker on second and two out, Wills hits to right center. And Joe Nosek misses on a diving catch. Parker legs it home with the fourth run for the Dodgers. And for Morey, it's a double. Merritt, checking the runner at second, suddenly whirls and fires the ball. And they pick Wills off with Quillacy slapping the ball on him. Morey doesn't like it. And Alston in the dugout has the what happened look. With two away, Fairley hits deep to left center. Joe Nosek races back and makes a fine one-handed catch to retire the side. In the Dodger eighth, Johnson is called out, attempting to steal second. Lou objects loudly, but not long. Osteen still has a shutout going into the ninth. Zimmerman hits a high bouncer straight at Wills. Morey steps on second, fires to first, and it's a double play. The Dodgers win four to nothing, and Claude Osteen is the man of the hour in Los Angeles. The slender lefty hurled a five hitter to break the momentum of the Twins. Baseline speed gave Los Angeles an early lead in the fourth game, and the Dodgers won it handily seven to two behind superb five-hit pitching by Don Drysdale. It evened the series at two victories each. Ron Fairley, hitting well so far, tries to keep in the groove. Don Drysdale has reason to smile after his brilliant performance yesterday. Tony Oliva, the American League batting champion, sharpens up his throat. Cal Griffith, Minnesota Twins president, has done a tremendous job building the Twins into a pennant winner. Jim Cott, the massive Minnesota Southpaw, begins warming up. And his opponent once again will be Mr. K of the Dodgers, Sandy Koufax. Wills and manager Mealy bring the lineup cards to the umpire's huddle. Several hundred sports writers from this country and even from overseas cover the colorful action. This is the last 1965 series game in Dodger Stadium, and the fans are out in force. Maury Wills leads off in the Dodger first. Jim Cott makes one too good, and Maury drives the ball down the right field line. It bounces into the stands for a ground rule double. Gilliam, reactivated this spring by the Dodgers after being a coach, is the next hitter.
Gilliam picks on a pitch from Jim Cott and smashes the ball into right field for a single. Will slides into the plate with the first Dodger run. Davis lays down a sacrifice bunt, and Killebrew fires to first base, but the ball goes through Quillis's hands. Then Gilliam scores from first. It's a quick two to nothing lead for Los Angeles. In the Dodgers second inning, Dick Krasinski lashes a hard smash to deep short. And Versailles makes a spectacular backhanded stop on the ball. He's back on the grass, but he gets off a strong throw. The ball seems to be there in time for the out. But umpire Vargo calls Trasuski safe because Minch's foot was off the bag. Swifty Lou Johnson scores in the Los Angeles third as the Dodgers add two more runs and pull out to a four to nothing lead. In the Dodger fourth with one run home, Davis tries to steal second. Willie stumbles and falls far short of the bag. So he starts an Australian crawl. Or perhaps it's a Davis land paddle. But he gets there, and safely, too. Sandy Koufax is pitching hitless ball as Harmon Killebrew comes to bat in the fifth. Kovacs pitches and Killebrew lifts a pop fly into short center. Davis dives for it, but can't hold the ball. It's a single and the end of the no-hitter. John Kennedy is at third for Los Angeles in the twin seventh when Kovacs starts out by fanning Versailles. Joe Nosek manages to meet the ball and Kennedy can't reach it. But Will speeds across and makes a backhanded stop. Maury cuts loose with a strong and accurate throw to first base. The play is close, very close. But umpire Vargo calls Nosek safe. And it's the second hit off Koufax. With Nosek on first, Koufax fans Oliva for his ninth strikeout of the game. With two men on in the Dodgers' seventh, Koufax singles off Jim Perry and fairly scores. Wills is next for Perry and hits through the middle. Jonasik juggles the ball. But it is no factor as Roseboro scores easily. And the Dodgers pull away seven to nothing. In the Twins eighth with Allison on first and one out, Mincher hits towards short. Wills goes far to his left, grabs the ball, and while on the dead run, flips it perfectly to Trususki at second base. Dick leaps up and while high in the air, gets off a pivot throw to complete a fantastic double play. In the ninth, there are two on with one out, following singles by Quillacy and Valdespino. Koufax takes a look at second, pitches, and Nosek whistles a liner to short. Will spears it and tosses to Dick Trasuski, who races over to cover second. It nips Frank Quillacy off the bag for a double play that puts a sudden end to the inning and the game. The Dodgers win seven to nothing and take a three to two lead in the series. Willie Davis tied Honus Wagner's record with three stolen bases and Wills tied another with four hits. But it was Sandy Koufax who showed the way. He fanned 10, allowed only four hits. He was simply invincible. Wills 
and Willie Davis certainly seem completely relaxed. Bob Allison insists things will be different now that the Twins are back home. Starting pitchers Jim Grant and Claude Osteen pose for photographers. Owner Walter O'Malley of the Dodgers and his wife beam with happiness. After all, the Dodgers have just won three straight. Baseball's tremendous appeal is evidenced again with a Minnesota crowd of 49,578. In the Twins first with Versailles on, Nosek hits back to Claude Osteen. The Dodger lefty whirls and fires to second. Will steps on the bag and makes his pivot throw while leaping through the air like a ballet dancer. And it's a double play, checking the first Minnesota threat. In the top of the fourth, it's still a scoreless tie. Batty is on first base in the Twins' fourth when Allison approaches the plate and looks toward Coach Martin. Bob Allison levels his bat. And there it goes. Into the left field stand. Allison circles the bases in such joyful haste he almost catches up with Batty as he rounds third. Bob is welcomed at the plate by Batty and Mincher adds his congratulations. In the Minnesota sixth, Howie Reed comes in to pitch for Los Angeles. Wes Parker gets set at first base. Earl Batty leads off and hits a shot down the line. Parker with split second reaction makes a dazzling backhanded stop and then scrawls across the foul line. But the Dodger rookie calmly gets to his knees and throws perfectly to Reed covering the bag and Batty is out. With two out and Allison on second, Quillacy is purposely passed. That brings Grant to the plate, and Martin urges him on. Jim Grant steps into the box, gets set, and then rips into the first pitch. It's back, back, away oh, back for a home run. The only other American League pitcher ever to hit a World Series home run was Jim Bagby of the 1920 Cleveland Indians, oddly enough, against the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Mudcat still is on cloud nine, coming around to score. His three-run homer builds the lead to five to nothing. The Twins take the field in the seven. Fairly leads off, and he really gets a hold of one. It sails into the bullpen. That's the second homer of the series for Ron, who has been the most consistent Dodger hitter, as well as the most productive one, with six runs batted in so far. Grant goes into the ninth with a five to one lead. After he retires the first two, Johnson singles to left to keep the Dodgers alive. Grant still needs another out. And the next man he faces is Wes Parker. Grant fires once more, and Parker grounds to Quillacy for an easy out. Minnesota wins, and the series is tied at 3 all. The Twins mob the Mudcats who not only pitched a superb six-hitter with only two days rest, but put the game away with a three-run homer. The Dodgers loosen up with a pepper game on the sidelines. Sandy Koufax, always congenial and cooperative, chats easily with reporters. Earl Batty patiently awaits his turn in batting practice. Jim Cott and Sandy Koufax are the rival starters for the third time in the series. And now it's a final showdown. The championship is at stake. And Minnesota fans turn out for a record crowd of over 50,000. 
the twins take the field and a long exciting campaign culminates in one final climactic battle. Jim Cott gets ready for the first inning. With two out and Gilliam on second, Lou Johnson pokes a short fly to right. Oliva makes a fine catch. Lou Johnson leads off for Los Angeles in the fourth. With a count of one and one, Johnson hammers a long drive down the left field line. It may be foul. No, it strikes the foul pole screen and drops back onto the field as Allison watches helplessly. It's the second homer of the series for the 32-year-old veteran who was hurriedly called up from the minors last spring when Tommy Davis, the team's leading hitter, fractured a leg. All season long, the aggressive, spirited outfielder was a vital factor in Dodger success. Jim Cott calmly rubs up a new ball. He winds up and pitches. Jim Cott calmly rubs up a new ball. He winds up and pitches. Tom Fairley slams the ball into the right field corner where it caroms away from Oliva. And Ron has a stand-up double. Umpire Ed Hurley gets a new supply of baseballs. Parker, the next batter, looks for a sign from Coach Preston Gomez. With Mincher playing in for a possible bunt, Parker chops a high bouncer over his head. Oliva drops the ball as he starts to throw. And Ron fairly slides home. Manager Mealy calls in Al Worthington to check the rally. The Dodgers lead two to nothing. In the Minnesota fifth, Koufax gets ready to face Frank Quillacy with one out. Sandy delivers and Quillacy wallops one off the fence in left center. The ball bounces high in the air and by the time Johnson recovers, Quillacy has an easy double. Umpire Hurley enters a lineup change. Rich Rollins is pinch hitting for Worthington. Rollins draws a walk when Koufax has trouble keeping the ball down. With two men on and one out, and Koufax having control trouble, Alston goes out to relax him. Sandy gets his sign. Gilliam is on his toes at third. Sandy looks at second, pitches, and Versailles rips a drive toward third like a rifle shot. Gilliam makes a miraculous stop for a force out. Let's look at that again with the action slowed down. Gilliam shows lightning reflexes as he darts to the foul line to make a backhanded stab of the ball. But after being spun around, he nimbly recovers to step on third. It saves at least one run, perhaps two. And the Dodgers still lead two to nothing. In the twin six, Koufax whistles a pitch past Oliva. It's Sandy's seventh strikeout. The last half of the ninth, Koufax still has his shutout. With one out, Killebrew singles to left. Parker talks with Koufax. Koufax faces Earl Batty and fans him on the third pitch. Now Sandy is one out away from victory. Victory's victory for manager Alston. A new National League record. And the scoreboard message goes for all fans everywhere. Indeed it was a terrific season.